Good morning. morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. Good. I don't know about you, but you can feel the spirit in this room this morning, can't you? The music sure does that for us and to us. Praise God. <laughs> Explanation point. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord and prayer this morning before we start. Father, I just thank you for this day, and I thank you for being here with us. Father, you live inside of us, but days like today, Lord, we just come and worship you and make you the focus. You come upon us, and we can feel you, Lord, and we thank you for that feeling. I just ask this morning that you fill us up. Fill us up with your goodness, your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. And Father, as we are here worshiping this morning, I just pray that you help us to open our hearts and our minds to the word you have for us this morning the message that you want us to receive. And not only hear it, but then to take it, appreciate it, and apply it to our lives and to the lives of others. Father, we thank you for those ministry opportunities that you put in front of us that we can tell someone about the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. We can tell people about this little baby boy, boy born in a manger in Bethlehem and what that means for them and what he has done by that birth, by his life, death, and resurrection. Father, we just thank you so much. And I just pray for those who could not be with us here this morning, Lord, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, I just pray that you touch them right now, knowing, letting them know that you are with them and that we are also with them in thought and with our heart. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing pretty good? I want to talk about preparation a little bit this morning. As we go through this Advent season, it is a season of preparation. But what is really the meaning of preparation? It's probably the best thing we have to start with. And I think we, we all understand what the meaning of preparation is. But if you look in Webster, it says to make ready or suitable for a specific purpose, ready or suitable for a specific purpose, or another way, the action or process of making ready or being made ready for use or consideration. Pretty much sums it up. And really, if you really think about it, for the last month, maybe month and a half for many of us, probably all of us, we have been in a state of preparation. Because we have Thanksgiving, which we just went through, and now we have Christmas coming up. And there's always things throughout every day that we got to prepare for, but if you are the one who is hosting family get-togethers or hosting parties for Thanksgiving, there is much preparation to be done in them. And I think probably all of us have experienced that to some degree. And if I have to be honest, the women probably do more than the men do, but we won't go there. But if you think about it, if you're the one hosting the party, and you're the one putting all the things together, you're the one pulling all the components and all the details, and you're putting them all in a line and making a priority, that's a lot of work. Especially when it comes to getting family and friends together. Because everybody has a different schedule. And boy, try to get everybody at the same place at the same time, on the same day, is almost impossible. At least it is with our family. And I'm sure it is with everybody's family. So not only do you deal with that, then you have to prepare a meal. So that you have to have all the ingredients that you need. So you have to go shopping and get groceries and all that. And then you have to prepare your house. If you're like my wife, the house has to be spick and spam and everything has to be in its place. There's a lot of time involved to get it that way. And not too many people decorate for Thanksgiving, but you may have some decorating to do. But there's a lot of things to put in a row to make that day a good day. There's a lot of things to prepare. But boy, whenever all that is done and everybody gets there at your house and they're all there at the same time, you sit down to a meal, they walk into a house that's clean, warm, and cozy, it's full of love, they can sit down and you can sit down and enjoy that meal together. You can have fellowship for that day. Those people really are blessed. Because they can enjoy the fruit of your preparation, can't they? And if you're the one doing all the prepping, 
you can even enjoy that day more fully because you know everything's done. You don't have to stress out about it. So it's good for everybody. And then we're going into Christmas, which you have all those same type of scenarios, but now it's even heightened because there's some more things to do. Christmas is a little bit bigger celebration, a little bit bigger holiday than what Thanksgiving is. So not only do you have the schedules to deal with, the cooking to deal with, the cleaning and preparing of the home, which now includes usually decorating. I don't know about you, but I do all the decorating at the house, and I usually do too much than I should, but decorating involves getting everything out of the shed or out of your attic, wherever you store it, bringing it into the house. And then everything that you have sitting around, your everyday knickknacks and pictures, they all come down and they go into a coat and you shove them into a corner. And then you get all this Christmas stuff out and you decorate your house. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of prep. Not only that, you put up a tree. Now you have to decorate the tree. Then you want to, well, I need lights outside. So then you do that. It's a lot of work. Not only that, now you would like to buy gifts for people. And that's a big thing to do also. So you have to prepare, go shopping, prepare the day. You have to do all that. So preparing for Christmas is, is a lot of preparation. It's a lot of work. But again, if you're the one hosting the party and all the preparations are made, you've taken all these details and you've put them all together and you've got your ducks in a row, those people who come there that day, again, are blessed because they can relax. Again, they walk into a home that's decorated. I like to have the lights turned down low so the Christmas lights are on. It creates a cozy atmosphere. The kids can come in and have a good time. You can sit down and enjoy a meal. It's a good day of fellowship. Again, your guest can come and they are blessed by the work that you have done. And hopefully, hopefully they appreciate the work and the effort that you have put into it. Because the work you have put into it has been done with a lot of passion and love and conviction because you wanted to have a good day for yourself. How many are the host family for Christmas? Just a couple of us. So you know yourself what we're talking about. We can see through these two examples of just Thanksgiving and Christmas that it's good to be prepared. It's important to be prepared. And that's any station in life, whatever we are doing, it's good to be prepared. And one thing that amazes me for any of you who cook, especially a big meal, how do you get everything to come out of the oven and be on the table at the same time? You could have six different dishes along with a turkey and dessert. It, it all comes together at one time, so when you sit down, you're able to eat it all and it's all still hot. That just amazes me. So anybody who does that, my hat's off to you. <laughs> Because if we, if we don't have the right preparation, there definitely can be chaos, can't it? If you do not have all the schedules lined up, you might have everybody arriving on the same day, but maybe different times. So if that happens, or you have your meal prepared, but the turkey comes out and everything else is not done, things don't work. Without the proper preparation, we can definitely miss those blessings and that fruit of those blessings that is intended for the day. Another, another example I'd like to bring up, and I don't know if any of you have had this job or not, but if you have a job where you have to give a report to the board at the end of the quarter. Now those people on the board, they're expecting certain information. They're expecting to hear uh, what has happened over the last quarter, and they need this information to be able to do their job with what's coming in the future. What do they need to plan for the next quarter? It's your job to compile all this information in the last three months. But if you wait till the night before and you think, well, I better get on this and, and get this report done, you know that that's not going to happen. You can, no way can you compile all that information and be prepared in one night for a report to that magnitude. So those people who are sitting in that boardroom 
were not receiving what they needed to receive because you did not prepare. They could not do what they need to do because they are not prepared because you weren't prepared. So we see the importance of being prepared. What do we call this? Word of God. Word of God. We call it the Bible. Some people call it God's inspired word. I like to think of it as God's word. He inspired me to write it, but it is God's word. I also think of it as a love story. Anybody ever think of it as a love story? The whole thing is a love story that's made up of many different stories. And if you think about it, it's full of drama, it's full of intrigue, it's full of mystery, and even for us guys, it's, it's full of shoot 'em up and war type things. You know, that's what us guys like. It's all those things compressed into one big book that is a love story. But did you ever think about it as an instrument? instructional booklet. I might even think of it as a book of preparation. How many of us have a hard time reading the Old Testament? I'm not a big fan of reading the Old Testament. i got to be honest about it. Sometimes it's pretty dry. You get into all those genealogy things or you read the book of what is it, Leviticus that talks about all the sacrificial rituals and all that. It's a little hard to get through. But if we look at the Old Testament as a whole, we really see God prepping his people for the coming Messiah. And as I've said before, from the very time that Adam ate the fruit in the Garden of Eden, God had a plan to bring his people back to him. God had a plan of reconciliation and redemption. He had a plan to make his people righteous enough in his sight, sinless, perfect, so they, so we, can be in his presence today. That plan was immediate. God didn't take a few weeks or a few months or a few years to figure it out. When Adam ate the fruit, God knew what he had to do. And we also know that that was Jesus Christ. That was his plan. The Old Testament truly is a book of preparation, preparing his people for the arrival of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if this information is true. Of course, it was on the internet, so it had to be true. <laughs> One gentleman says that there are over 300 direct prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ. Another gentleman said there was over 400. I didn't take time to count them or look them all up. But I know there is a lot. Think about that. The Old Testament, it's hard to read and dry. And sometimes it's hard to understand. Is talking about Jesus Christ directly over 300 times. Now another gentleman says that this means that every part of the Old Testament must be interpreted in the light of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It may not relate directly to Christ, but it is a part of the larger context that must be understood in the light of who he is and what he has come to do. Now, if I read the Old Testament and I read those scriptures in light of Jesus Christ, thinking that everything in the Old Testament whether it is directly or indirectly related to him, if all, all those scriptures lead to Christ, that gives me a new perspective in reading the Old Testament. In preparing for this and going back and doing some reading of the Old Testament, it actually gave me a little bit more enthusiasm, not quite excitement, but more enthusiasm in reading the Old Text. Another minister described it this way. Think of the Old Testament of being a highway or an interstate that leads directly to Jesus Christ. But connected to the interstate are many other roads, and we know that. Our interstate, you have 
directly to Jesus Christ, but there are many offshoots. There's avenues and streets and alleys that go off in all different directions. But they are all connected to the highway. So if I'm over here and I'm on this alley somewhere, it's still connected. I can still get to the highway one way or the other. So all these stories in the, in the Old Testament lead to that highway and lead to Jesus Christ. You can say all roads lead to Jesus. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, there's actually a scripture in the Old Testament that has the word highway in it. If you go to Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, maybe you don't remember that from the Old Testament, but John the Baptist used those same words. So what's he talking about? Make straight in the desert a highway for God. I don't know. <laughs> Make straight in the desert a highway for God. Along many highways, maybe you have obstacles that keep you from getting to where you're going. What John is really saying here is get all those obstacles out of your way. Make straight so your highway is clear, so there's nothing hindering you from getting to Jesus. There's nothing in your way. That highway is not curvy. That highway is straight. You have a direct path to Jesus Christ. And if we don't believe that the Old Testament speaks directly about Jesus Christ, Jesus himself tells us that it does. Because if you go to John, chapter 5, verses 31 through 40, Jesus talks about this. Jesus speaking, and keep in mind that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Jewish leaders at the time. Jesus is saying, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. If I'm telling you about myself, I can tell you anything I want. I can embellish anything. But that does not make it true. It's just me spouting off. Jesus says, there is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Tony spoke about this last week. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has himself testified concerning me. All those things that Jesus was doing, all the miracles that he was doing, healing, raising people from the dead, testifies directly that he was who he said he was. Remember, he's talking to the Pharisees here. He said, You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does this, his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently, because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me and have eternal life. Remember at this time the, the New Testament was written. The scriptures that he's talking about is the old scrolls, the Old Testament scriptures that the Sadducees, Pharisees, and everybody else was studying. You study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. Jesus is saying those Old Testament scriptures are testifying about me. That I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Sadducees totally missed it. They were thinking that they were going to get eternal word, life just through the word, not through Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus tells us right here that all those scriptures testify to him. The Old Testament is leading us to Jesus Christ. That is the highway to Jesus Christ. 
The Sadducees, uh, sadly, were so caught up in religion and, and all that and power that they totally missed it. The first scripture we see in the Old Testament comes pretty quickly concerning Jesus Christ. It's in Genesis 3, 14 and 15. This isn't long after Adam ate the fruit and, and all that took place in the garden. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl in your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heels. I've probably read that 20 times throughout my life and never paid attention to what I was talking about, really. But this verse here, even though it's not extremely obvious when you just read it, it's talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 15, and I will put enmity, and I, I have a hard time saying that, but that word just means hate. God says he's going to put hate between you and the woman, between Satan and the woman. But let's go to the next line, between your offspring and hers. Well, if you think about it, who's the offspring of Eve? Jesus Christ. So God is going to put hate between Jesus Christ and Satan. Does anybody in the Bible know where there's any love between Satan and Jesus? There isn't. Last part of that verse says, He will crush your head. Who's He? Again, that is Jesus Christ. He will crush your head. If somebody has their head crushed, it's going to be death. God is telling Satan from the very beginning, Jesus is going to defeat you. And there's no doubt about that. You would think right there, Satan would have just given up. But the last part of that says, and you will strike his heel. Satan will strike his heel. Anybody have a chihuahua? You know those little yappy dogs? I'm not trying to offend anybody that has a chihuahua. Chihuahua, but it's that little yappy dog that will not face you face to face. They always want to run around back and nip at your heel. They, they don't have the courage to look you in the eye and then stare you down. They always like to run around and sneak attack from behind. <laughs> Just nipping at your heels. And their, their teeth aren't big enough to really make any damage or to hurt you, but it's annoying. Satan had no power over Jesus. He couldn't defeat Jesus. He wouldn't even look him in the eye. He had to run around and nip at his heels, so to speak. But Satan was more of an annoyance. He wasn't going to hurt Jesus, even though all through Scripture we see Satan trying to do that. But he never did. So I think of that as that being that little dog that just annoyed the heck out of him. Nipping at your heels. But right away in the Old Testament text we see Jesus. Right from the beginning, when we really look at the Scriptures, we can see Jesus. Some verses are not very obvious. Some are very obvious. We have a few of those to read. Let's go to Micah 5 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from the old, from ancient times. It's a pretty popular scripture. And one thing also, we already have the New Testament. So we know Jesus. We know about Him. We know the story. So it's easier to see Jesus in these verses. Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at Him, His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and His form marked beyond, beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Again, talking about Jesus in the Old Testament, leading us to him. 
And probably here at Christmas time, one of the most popular and familiar verses that we will read is Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's pretty familiar. That's prophecy from Isaiah about the coming king, the coming Messiah. And then one last one is Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And he will be called Emmanuel, or God with us. Praise God. So we can see God was preparing his people from the very beginning for the coming Messiah. God had to do that. If his people were going to reap the benefits and the blessing and the fruit of Jesus Christ, they had to prepare, be prepared for him to arrive. It would be uh, difficult for people to understand if just one day Jesus showed up. Nobody was looking for him. Who would understand him? Who would understand why he was there? You know, nobody would have known about it. No one would have understood. And it makes sense that if God wanted his people to know who Jesus is and to expect that he was coming, and once he got here to understand his message, to believe he was the Son of God, God had to prepare his people for that. The Old Testament leads us to Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can bring the benefit of God's preparation in our belief in Jesus. And I hate to say it, but there's a lot of Sadducees and Pharisees today also that miss Jesus. I think there are many Christians who are still caught up on the law, caught up on religious traditions and rituals. And that's where the importance is for them, that they don't really see the message of Jesus Christ. They still miss it. And if they miss it, they really miss all the blessings and the fruit of Jesus Christ that we know and experience. Well, how much time do we have? I didn't write this down. We'll go down a little rabbit trail, kind of. Uh, in God's preparation, it started at the beginning, and it really runs clear up to the time that Jesus comes out and is baptized by John the Baptist. Well, let's just talk about John the Baptist here shortly. In, in my way of thinking, John the Baptist is like the explanation point in God's prep, preparation. God has given us all this information up to this time, but John was his last card to play. He sent John, and John was predestined to be a great man and a prophet, preparing people for the coming of the Lord. He was the last one before Jesus arrived that was out there ministering in the wilderness saying, Jesus is coming, baptizing people with water. But John knew there was one coming that was greater than him, and it was his job to prepare those people for his coming. God used him as the last, the last big preparatory thing. Listen to John. So it was his job to go out and prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Not only to recognize him, but to believe him. What Jesus was going to teach was so different than what they were doing in the Old Testament. Sacrificial rituals, all of that. Jesus' message is going to be totally different than what the old message was. And people needed to be prepared for that. If they weren't going to be prepared, they wouldn't understand the message, and they weren't going to receive it, and they weren't going to believe it. So it was 
John's job to come out of the wilderness, get a hold of these people, and tell them what was coming, who was coming, what he was going to do, how he was going to do it. You need to listen. You need to be prepared because he's coming. God put the explanation point on his preparation with John the Baptist. Is how I kind of look at it. Jesus came, and we know that he came to John and was baptized in the river and the Holy Spirit was sent upon him. Jesus' ministry starts at that point. What was Jesus doing? If you really look at it in the text of what we're talking about today, Jesus was preparing us also. What was Jesus' message? What was he preparing us for? Can you answer that? If someone came up to you and asked you that question, how would you answer it? What was Jesus' message from the very beginning? When I thought about it, I thought, well, it had to be love. Love is a big word. It taught, taught us to love the God, the Father with all our heart and all our soul with all our mind. Love our neighbor, love, love, everything we saw centers around love. But there is a scripture that tells us that he was doing something else first. And if you go to Mark 1.15, it says, The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come here. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus was coming to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he's not talking about a new locality. He's talking about authority. God's authority was coming. And that's what Jesus was proclaiming was God's authority. The good news that he's proclaiming is himself. The good news is Jesus Christ. So if you want to paraphrase Mark 1.15, we're going to summarize Jesus' preaching as follows. God's reign is at hand. God's power is being unleashed. Turn your life around and put your trust in the good news. Jesus was coming to proclaim the kingdom of God. It's stated over 53 times in the New Testament that Jesus says that. Jesus himself tells us the very same thing. Luke 4, 42 through 44. At daybreak, Jesus went out to the solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving, leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues in Judea, proclaiming the word of God, the kingdom of God, proclaiming the authority of our Heavenly Father, now, it's within that proclamation that Jesus teaches us and prepares us for the love of the Father. Jesus teaches us of repentance and forgiveness. He frees us from the slavery of sin. He teaches that grace is granted without merit. We are adopted into God's family. Jesus teaches us that we are one in Him as He is one in the Father. It's through Jesus that we have been made perfect. He was preparing that message for us in the sight of the Father. And it is through Jesus Christ also that we receive the Holy Spirit. And those are just a few things that proclaiming the kingdom of God has done for us. But Jesus also was preparing us for something else. And that was ministry. He had 12 guys following him around and he was teaching them, preparing them for when he left that they could go on and continue what he was doing. He prepares us for ministry also. So we can go out and proclaim the kingdom of God. So we can go out and spread the gospel in the light of Jesus Christ. Not only that, Jesus was preparing them and he prepared us for his death, his resurrection, and his ascension to be with his Father. 
Again, if Jesus wouldn't have taught us that and prepared us for that, and one day he just was gone, and another day he showed up again, how many people would have understood that? So Jesus tried to prepare his people for what was going to happen. You know, and it's through that preparation, Jesus' preparation, that we do have salvation. That we will have life after we leave this place. That we will spend eternity with Him. Isaiah 53 is one of the clearest statements of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for His people. In the entire Bible. This is another minister taught, speaking this. He says, Christ came to redeem you from suffering and sin forever by sacrificing himself as your substitute on the cross. He was crushed for our iniquities, and by his wounds we are healed. If that's not blessing and fruit of God's preparation, I don't know what is. It's through God's preparation through the Old Testament, through Jesus' preparation through the New Testament, that we have exactly that. We are free from the slavery of sin and suffering. And we have life after death. We have salvation. If you want to put it one way, it all centers around Jesus Christ. If we look at the Advent wreath here this morning, we see the blessings of our Savior. Hope, joy, peace, and love. But those things are only possible if Jesus is the center of our life. Those things are only possible if we've taken all that preparation that God has given us and we appreciate it. We soak it in. We listen to it. But we believe it. It all centers around Jesus Christ. The next time you read the Old Testament, read it in the light of Jesus Christ, knowing that it really centers around Him and it leads us to Him. Christmas is a celebration of Jesus' birth. But I want to say that it's bigger than that. It's a celebration of Jesus Himself. Not just a baby coming to a manger in Bethlehem. Amazing thing of that. That's a, the greatest story ever told is what the song says. And that story will never change. The importance of that story will never change. It's the beginning of Jesus' life. But this Christmas, I want you to focus on celebrating Jesus himself. As a baby, as a man, as a minister. As the one who died on the cross where it was resurrected and is now in heaven watching over us and watching over his church. And as we are in this state of preparation over the next couple weeks, finalizing everything up until Christmas Day, do all those preparations in light of Jesus Christ. Because it's easy for us to get distracted. The world is very distracting, especially at Christmas time, because the retailers have been on Christmas since Halloween. We get bombarded with all this stuff. And sometimes we can lose the importance and the reason why we are even preparing in the first place. Make it centered around Jesus Christ. When you hang the bulbs on the tree, do it in appreciation of Jesus. When you're in the kitchen and you have your Counters all full of stuff, and there's flour all over the place, and there's gravy spilled on the floor. Do it in appreciation of Jesus Christ. Hanging the tree, the lights outside when your fingers are cold. Do it in appreciation of Jesus Christ. You're celebrating. You're preparing to celebrate this man, this this baby, this man. 
our Savior, we should celebrate him in everything that we do. Make your celebration center around him. And the other thing that shouldn't just happen in Christmas. We should be doing that every day. It's just heightened at Christmas time. But let's celebrate together. Put him in the center of your life. Put him in the center of your preparation so we can have hope, joy, peace, and love. Amen. Amen. Amen.